Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Before we do get started, I do want to encourage you, as you begin your Christmas shopping, remember store.greatdetectives.net. I have five paperback books out that will make great Christmas presents for fans of detective fiction with Slime Incorporated, and also my superhero comedy novels, Tales of the Dim Night, Fly Another Day, Powerhouse Hard Pressed, and Ultimate Midlife Crisis. And you can pick those up at store.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for today's episode of Nick Carter, and I've got a very special announcement. I've reviewed the latest uh, OTRR certified release, and we have three additional episodes of Nick Carter, two of which we're going to go ahead and go back in time a bit. The first time, uh, way back more than a couple years, to June of 1946. Uh, the original air date on this one is June the 25th of, of 1946, and the title is The Case of the Missing Alarm Clock. <laughs> Another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability of solving crime is unequal in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Gotta get Mr. Taylor down here. Oh, I wonder how it's turned. I don't know, it was awesome. Seven, two. Where is it? Come on, Mr. Taylor. There's got to be something. Huh? What is it? Let me speak to Mr. Taylor, quick. Right here. Where is he? Right here. Well, when's he coming in? I wouldn't know. Any message? Hey, yes. Tell him the warehouse is on fire. Tell him to get hold of Mr. Emerson and get down here at once. Did you say Mr. Emerson? Yes, yes. Get the boat down here at once. The warehouse is burning up. Dangerous to me the way them walls are doing up. It's dangerous. I told them so. 
Why, any minute, them what? Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. What? 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 Hi, Peppy. 
Well, business must be dull with you, no matter how it is with me. How do you mean this? Never saw you reading a mystery magazine before. Oh, Dad. I picked it up in the drugstore this morning and I stepped into my coffee. And I've like seen a little bit dull around here this morning. I was just looking through it. <laughs> as long as you don't believe anything you're reading, anything will hurt you, I think. <laughs> oh, uh, did you find anything interesting with the fire in here? Oh, I don't know. Might be the work of the Jersey Firebug, since an alarm clock was used to set it off. The Jersey Firebug? Yes. Why the surprise? Well, there's an article in this magazine I'm reading on him and all the fires he's set. Yes. Oh, one of the series on pyromaniacs, apparently. Yes, so. Did you explain that system you used? Well, sure. You see? Diagrams and descriptions tells all about the clock. Well, does it show how the clock was hooked up? Oh, well, not in detail, no. It just says it was used to set off the fire. Right. Or does it mention the fact that he always robbed the safe first? No. Uh, did he? Hmm. Well, someone should have read that article and tried to indicate the Jersey in West End area without knowing the best thing. <laughs> oh, oh, uh, did you find out to whom the Army serial number belongs? Oh, after considerable telephoning around and getting shunted from one person to another, I finally got what she wanted. Yes. He saw Jay Haskin let out a couple of months ago on a medical discharge. And he died in the roast, as they told him. I checked the U.S. yes, but they have no record of his having any job. You found any address for him? Well, the only address they had was the Sunset Trailer Camp out on Long Island. Hey. If you were discharged because of men died in the roast, you must be the kind of man who would set fires and things. Oh, Patsy, you ought to know better than that. But me, to... Patsy, when they discharge a man from the army because of an erosis, it doesn't mean he's cracked up or crazy. An anxiety in the is like overwork, run down. Boy, well, undoubtedly perfectly sane. Too many people, just as you did now, think a man with a medical discharge is nuts and refuse to have anything to do with him. All he really needs is a room as a chance to pull himself together again. Be just the same as you or I. Oh, but Nick, this clue you found that the fire seems to lead directly to him. Well, even if he did it, Patsy, it has nothing to do with his having a medical discharge. No war angle to this whatsoever. Uh, and who's never been in the army become fire for? Uh, well, I'm sorry, Nick. I guess I just didn't think. Yeah, just like a lot of other people. Oh, well, I'm not trying to be tough with you about this, Patsy, but it's just that... Hi, uh, Nick. Well, how are you, Patsy? Well, uh, hi, Waldo. From the look on your face, you must have some news. Uh, uh, well, what'd you find, Waldo? You were right, Nick. The clock we found at the warehouse is picked up altogether different from the one that he had. Not the same at all. Hmm. If it's lying, no space to crack, and an article in a magazine telling how to keep that. Uh, uh. I'd say it all adds up to let the Jersey Firebird out completely. In which case, you better be on our way to the Sunset Trailer Camp and have a talk with Charles J. Haskell. This is quite a camp, isn't it, Nick? Yeah. Must be more or less permanent, too. The only thing looks. Oh, poor Waldo. What caused that remark? Thinking how sore Waldo was that you wouldn't bring him along. Waldo is one of those things called a procrastinator. You <laughs> give him a job to do, but because it's just routine running around, he tries to put it off as long as he possibly can. <laughs> oh, well, uh, this is the Hatchin trailer, this green one with the white trim. It matches the description the man that gave you. This is the right location. Yeah. But if the door being opened means Hatchin's around somewhere. Well, we can look in, can't we? That won't hurt anything. Yeah, that should be all right. But I hope it shows up soon. Oh, there you are, Nick. Oh, man. Well, well, the right arm of the law. What happened to you? You're right behind us. The next time I looked around, you disappeared. Oh, I got stopped at that last red light, then I got boxed up behind a truck and couldn't get out. <laughs> Everything happens to me. <laughs> um, is this the uh, hospital place? Yes, we were just going to have a look inside while we were waiting. Just look here. Hmm? Look at that. Yeah. He's made sort of a shrine of his war souvenirs. Hey, two very pistols, champagne, cartridge belt. And two shafts like the one Nick found after the fire, with the same identification on them. Yeah. And there should be a third one. Empty spaces. Yeah, I guess, all right. What's in them? Magnesium flares. Oh. oh, what a beautiful blaze that makes. It certainly looks like it has some had something to do with it. And the greenish blue sort of explosion the Watson saw could easily be a magnesium player. Yeah. It don't look so good for Mr. Haskins. He's got some pretty fast explaining to do. Must be around somewhere. I wouldn't have let the door open this way. What the devil are you 
still towing in my trailer. Are you Charles Hudson? Yes, so what? Stand up here to see you. We're out, so we just looked in. How'd you get in? Um, the door was open, so we walked in. Yeah, that's a likely story. I left the door locked. You must have broken it. That's what you did. What do you want? Are you sure you locked the door when you left? Sure, I'm sure. You calling me a liar? Not at all. But it was open when we got here. Yeah? Well, look here. You forced it open. See? Here's the marks of the Jimmy. What? Huh? I thought you're right. Why is Jimmy open? And we didn't do it, Haskell. Believe me. Why should I believe you? I can see what I see. The lock's busted and you're inside. Now, look here, Haskell. Cops don't go around breaking in doors that way. Cops? They're the worst of the whole bunch. A lot of... Wait, no, all right, all right, Haskell. Wait a minute. When did you leave here? Yesterday morning. What's it to you? What have you been doing since then? Why should I answer a lot of silly questions? I don't have to. you better take it easy. Now, we want some information. If you won't tell us here, I'll have to take you down to headquarters and make you answer. What did I do? Kill somebody? What have you been doing since yesterday morning? <laughs> Isn't it bad enough to have no home but this lousy trailer? No place to bring my wife where we can live together? No job, no nothing? But you have to come here and accuse me of heaven knows why. We're not accusing you of anything yet. Uh, tell me, Haskam, uh, what happened to that stack of magnesium flares that's missing from your collection? What do you mean, missing? It was here when I left. Well, it's not there now. Any idea what happened to it? No, I haven't. You probably took it. Hey, my alarm clock has gone, too. Well, that's good. You bust in my door, steal my stuff, then ask me a lot of silly questions. I'm not accountable to anybody anymore. I got my discharge. I'm a free man as anybody can be with the world the way it is. Look, Haskell, you're not making things any easier for yourself by doing this. Hey, hi, Charlie. What? What's Who's a that? job for? What job? The trucking job you had. What do you mean, trucking job? You're crazy. Oh, like that, huh? Okay, buddy. How did you know me? I didn't know you. I thought you didn't have any job. You must know it was just a temporary job I took yesterday. Trucking some furniture. Yep. Yeah. Furniture, did you say? Yes, furniture for the Emerson Warehouse. It was a rush job. They had a lot of stuff to get out in a hurry and needed drivers. Paid over scale, so I took it. I needed the money. And I still have no job. Next, you hear that? Hear what? Look, Haskell, you go to work for Emerson. You're going all night. The warehouse burns down by a fire. Set with magnesium flares like you've got there. And you I had nothing to do with any fire. No? Your army number was on the bag. We found the building when the fire was out. A bag just like them two you got in there now. Son, you and I are going down to headquarters. I want to know a lot more about this. Hey, you can't take me. No. Uh, oh, yes, I can. I'm going to. Tell me this. Uh, no, not just yet, honey. I want to look around a bit. Uh, okay, I'll be seeing you. Come on, Haskell. We're going for a ride, you and me. Not me. You can't. Come on. Oh, Never mind. Beverly, so mixed up, he got into a jam without realizing what he was doing. I'm not satisfied as did. Don't forget the lock on the door was broken open. Well, couldn't he have done that as a blind? Oh, yes, he could. I'm not going to look around for prints, though, from the door first. Uh-huh. We can compare them with Haskins, though. It would be funny of those inside. And if they match? That would prove Haskins was a liar. And if they don't? Well, that's something else. Wouldn't prove much one way or the other. Not until we get some more facts to go with him. And that's our job right now, Pepsi. Getting all the facts we can. So the prince didn't know. So well, couldn't that mean that somebody was working with Haskam on this? It could. It could mean Haskam was innocent. Good afternoon. You the owner of this camp? Yeah, sure I am. But we're full up right now. See? Glad to hear. And I just want some information. Oh, sure. Glad to tell you what I can. See? You know Charlie Haskins, don't you? Oh, sure. Yeah. Nice young fella. He didn't have a chip on his shoulder all the time. Not a very sociable fellow, I should imagine. Sure ain't. Does he have any friends in the camp here? Sure don't. I've seen him talk to the young couple leaving beside him, but that's all. See? I suppose you know most of the people in this camp. Oh, sure, do. There ain't no chances just now. It's kind of the housing building. Uh-huh. All nice people? Oh, sure. Yeah. All except the guy got the tail of the other side of Haskell. Don't like him. He don't live there. Just use it as a kind of office. Office? What kind? I don't know. But there's always a lot of queer-looking men running in out there every night. At least I can get rid of them, but they ain't found no good reason. See? Well, what's the name of the man who lives there? Say, Jones. I didn't go. That's not a funny name. I'll look my name. Sounds like a long night. Jones home now? No, no, never there during the day. Only at night. 
Okay, thank you for your trouble. So long. Hey, so long, mister. Glad to help you. Eh? We, um, calling Mr. Jones, Carolyn? We are, Patsy, immediately. Before Mr. Jones gets back, I hope. Hey, may I speak to you a moment? What's on your mind? How well do you know Charlie Haskell? Well, is he in trouble? Maybe, maybe not. That's what I'm trying to find out. How well do you know him? Oh, just a feature. You don't make friends easy, that's I don't. So I know this. What was that about a job? Oh, why, yes. Uh, well, this fellow offered me a job running a truck yesterday. He rushed with, you know. When I was busy and I knew Charlie needed money, so I told him about it. Who offered you the job? Oh, a fellow named Jones. Uh, lives in that trailer right ahead of you there. I see. Okay, thanks very much. Oh, no, mention. Say, I hope Charlie makes out all right. Hmm, that certainly ties up, doesn't it, Miss? The mysterious Mr. Jones seems to be indicated as our next point of contact, at least. Oh. Looks as if Jones was out, Miss. Mr. Jones? Not so easy this time. His door is locked. Yes, sir. Well, anyway. It's all daylight like this. The owner said Jones was never around in the daytime. Yeah, we can't wait. There. Oh, that was easy. I'll bet you what to do. Stay outside the door. You see, anybody looks as if they were coming in, start singing. Mm-hmm. And I can get out fast. Right. Hey, listen. For me, you can look right into Haskins' cell and see his work given his family. Maybe Mr. Jones... Maybe. Now, don't forget. If anyone comes, you will sing. Mm-hmm. He bought meat wholesale and had it brought to the warehouse and 
distributed it from there. Mm. It stayed at the warehouse only for a short time, so we didn't need refrigeration. But recently, with so many patriotic butchers refusing to handle black market meat, the stuff piled up into the two rooms of clothes. Taylor didn't worry about the meat spoiling, but he did worry that government inspectors might trace some of the shipments back to him and find all the stuff that was stored there. Oh. So he decided to get rid of the evidence by burning down the building. Which he did. And he did that part very completely. But he never dreamed we'd be able to trace it back to him as he did. And finding right there in that trailer the Jimmy he used to pry open Haskins' door with the green paint still on it. And finding the winding handle that belonged to the alarm clock we remodeled to use in starting the fire, which the blame squarely on his shoulders. And let Charlie Haskin out in time. Fortunately, yes. I wonder if this break in Haskins' favor will make him any more pleasantly disposed for the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. It's tough when a young fellow like that showers on everything. I'm going to try to pull him out of it. I asked Manny to let him know. They told me you wanted to see me. Come in, Aspen. Still think I'm a crook? No. I don't think you're a crook. I never did. But if you've been a little more cooperative, with can help. Why should I be? Nobody ever cooperates with me. You don't give them a chance. Chance to what? You have to be friendly. They're all against me. I can't get a break anyway. No, no, no. Nobody's against you. That little tough luck, same as a lot of other men just out of the service have had. And you've made a personal issue out of it. Just your own personal reaction to an unpleasant situation. How do you figure that? I can't get a job. I can't get a place where my wife and I can live together. I can't no, no, get... hold on, hold on, hold on. That's the fact. See if we can't do something about this. You know any other men who don't have jobs? Sure, plenty of them. You know any other men who haven't found a place to live? Yeah. But what's that got to do with... Everything. Are all these other men you know convinced that the world is out to do them dirt? Well, no. Not all of them, but I know a couple of them. Well, well, you? Aspen, you're one of a small minority of guys that take it out and break it. It doesn't help the situation at all. Well, maybe, but I haven't what do you had do? a I'm an auto mechanic. And a darn good one, too. I'm sure you are. Suppose I find you a job. Have you take it? Sure, I'll take it. And if you and your wife will be satisfied with a furnished room until something better offers. I can fix you up to that, too. Interested? Sure. Wait. If I can have Mary here with me, I... I, I feel a whole lot better. About everything, I guess. Oh, good. Here's $50. That'll help you to pay your wife's transportation and buy whatever things you need. I don't know. Give me a second. Oh, look, Mr. Carter, I... I don't need your money. We'll make out somehow. Now, look, this isn't fair. It's a loan. I expect you to pay me back when you can. Thanks, Mr. Carter. You're swell. That's Miss Carter, all over. Only trying to help somebody when he can. Why are you doing all this for me? A stranger. Captain, we all owe you, boys. You're in the service. More than you can ever be paid. And if anything I can do will uh, help to pay that debt and get you started on the right road, I want to do it. I'm going to see that you get what's coming to you. Oh, yes. That's what you usually say to the crooks you tell. You're going to get what's coming to you. Oh, yes, that's the idea. But this time, I'm talking to a friend. Right, Hudson? Right, Mr. Carter. Oh, gotcha. Friend is a wonderful thing to have. Well, Nick, how about letting us in on your story for next week? Glad to do it, Phil. My story includes the list of the diamonds stolen from Mrs. Larkin's safe, the print of a pointed shoe in the garden, the telephone number that refused to answer, and the place where diamonds are worth more than anywhere else in the world. And there was excitement, too. When our plane dropped down through the fog trying to locate that ship at sea, oh, I was sure my last hour had come. Clues and excitement, eh? Sounds like a good combination. What's the name of the story, Nick? I call it The Case of the Unwilling Criminal. <laughs> which is produced and directed by Jack McGregor, is copyrighted by Stephen Smith Publications, Incorporated.
Pictured stories of Mick Carter appear in every issue of the Shadow Comics. In the broadcast of Mick Carter, Master Detective, Ron Clark is starred as Mick, Charlotte Manson is featured as Patrick, Matty is played by Ed Latimer, Waldo by Humphrey Davis. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Peggy Mayer and Jock McGregor. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons living or dead, or to actual places is purely coincidental. Mick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these mutual stations every week at the same time. This is Bill Thompson saying so long until next week. This program was heard in Canada through the facilities of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Hi, this is Andrew from otrwesterns.com. I wanted to invite you to come take a look at our site. We stream live OTR Westerns 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, along with putting out podcasts of old-time radio westerns. Check us out at otrwesterns.com. You're listening to The Great Detectives of Old-Time Radio with Adam Graham. Now let's get back into the show. Welcome back. Well, a very um, interesting uh, episode and dealt with a serious problem uh, at the time. And that was the challenge faced by many uh, return veterans um, who had uh, bis- discharged with some sort of um, a problem, particularly uh, mental health uh, issues. Uh, could often be looked down upon. Uh, in many ways, this was a precursor to a lot of what we uh, deal with and now define uh, as um, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so uh, an early attempt to understand this and to you know treat it with some respect and uh, actual uh, understanding opposed to going off in some sort of unfair assumptions, which many people tended to do. Uh, and th- this was not the only um, effort uh, in entertainment to have some sort of understanding about this. Uh, Superman uh, was in the uh, newspapers as a Sunday uh, feature as well as a daily feature. And several weeks of the Superman Sunday feature were dedicated to a soldier who had to return due to um, what they were termed as combat fatigue and how Superman had to work with the man's family to get them to understand that it was not because he was cowardly or especially weak. So there was definitely these pushes to get some understanding and uh, and fairness for people who had served their country and suffered as a result of it. And, of course, the uh, problem of this being June 1946, less than a year after VJ Day, and housing and jobs were both problems in the post-war uh, world, uh, in a v- especially... Um, a cute way that this episode highlights. So I'm glad this episode was rediscovered. I wish it had been in better shape. But it's interesting from a historical perspective because it highlights so much uh, of what was going on in that post-war era and, and probably in a way that Nick Carter really didn't focus on the war, even when we have so many episodes that were actually from the uh, mid-war era. All right, well, now we turn to listener comments and feedback. Now, we do turn to listener comments and feedback. And uh, Natalie has a comment regarding the episode, uh, uh, The Case of the Homely Bride. She writes, what an outdated view of uh, women. Wow. That statement at the beginning, how she'd likely never marry in spite of her father's wealth, blow, blew me away. Otherwise, it was a good uh, episode. 
Um, I, I will say, um, and certainly I guess it's a bit of a contrast because, um, you know, on one hand you have a show that, uh, have very, uh, forward thinking, um, message about, uh, veterans and people suffering in combat, but you'll find in a lot of, um, you know, a lot of the old time radio that there is an attitude towards women who are considered to be less attractive in a lot of radio shows, uh, certainly not just uh, Nick Carter. Uh, There's a show I really like, Life with Luigi, which generally has a very sweet uh, natured take on the world. But one of the key plot points of the story is how Luigi wants to avoid uh, marrying uh, Pasquale's uh, daughter Rosa. And each episode, they just Rip poor Rose's appearance. Well, that's just, that is one of those things that you do um, encounter. I've, I've said a few times that when you listen to these shows, it's almost like being a guest in another time. And there are certainly positives and negatives to that. But thanks so much for the comment, uh, Natalie. And that will actually do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And then next Thursday, another episode of Nick Carter. In the meantime, uh, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio...